right. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me set up the screen sharing again. All right. Can everybody see that? Perfect. All right. Wonderful. So yeah, thanks a lot for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, so just quickly, my name is, is Danish Proll. Um, I've been doing VR for over a decade now. So I started as a cognitive scientist um, working with VR to basically run human experiments uh, back in the days, um, uh, looking at uh, human navigational behavior. And then, um, you know, the VR renaissance happened and I got pulled into that and ended up working uh, across different projects uh, early on. Uh, for Audi and and like uh, with Reflect and some other folks, uh, and eventually ended up uh, co-founding Reality IO in uh, 2016, um, where we've uh, done a bunch of things. Uh, but the thing that I want to talk about uh, today with you all is uh, puddling places and how we brought puddling places to the Apple Vision Pro. So, just a quick disclaimer. Um, We've, we've done most of our development before the actual launch. Um, as you know, access to dev kits and all of that stuff was quite limited. Um, this was about like two and a half months of work. Uh, we made a lot of, you know, uh, guesses. So like educated guesses, hopefully, and like what would work and what doesn't. Um, take all this with a grain of salt is my main message here. So um, we, we built these things and I hope to show you why we built certain things, why we made certain decisions. Um, but this is by no way the law. I think if we've learned anything of, uh, with VR uh, and AR and spatial computing over the years is things are changing, things are evolving. So um, you can, uh, I invite you to to think through the, the decisions and choices we made, um, but don't be afraid to make your own. Um, with that out of the way, so what are we going to talk about uh, here? Um, we're going to give you a quick overview over the Quest version, uh, PSVR version of Puzzling Places. We're going to look at the key design dimensions for the Apple Vision Pro. We're going to look at how we redesign Puzzling Places for Apple Vision Pro along those key design dimensions. And then um, we're going to close with some initial feedback we've gotten for Puzzling Places now that the device is out uh, and people can actually try it out and get it from the store and then have a quick look at the App Store landscape before we're gonna move over into the round table um, and the Q and A. So what's Puzzling Places? Puzzling Places is a super relaxed 3D jigsaw puzzle game. So for every, everyone who hasn't played it, you literally just take pieces of a 3D jigsaw puzzle and you puzzle them together. So you stick together the pieces. Um, and this is how it looks. Uh, this is our latest PlayStation VR trailer. Um, the core of the game, like the game feel is relaxing and meditative. It's trying to uh, get you into this flow state. It's trying to give you this, this satisfaction and this tangible feeling of progression that comes with building a classical puzzle. And uh, overall, we try to frame it in a way that is very simple. Like one of our guiding principles was basically not get in the way of puzzling because puzzling is a game mechanic that works. So um, we just wanted to bring that into VR, bring it into three dimensions. Uh, and, and not get in the way too much. Um, there is a sense of exploration, education, and photorealism, because what we do is we only use um, photorealistic scans made with photogrammetry of real world places. So all the places that you can puzzle in the game are actually real world places. Um, so you get this sense of exploration as well. Um, it's it's more of a background kind of thing though. Um, the places come come to life with soundscapes and all that, but there's no like obvious education. It's like this is the place, blah 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 blah. So there's no no additional information there. And then our audience is uh, more casual, so um, it's a it's yeah on the more casual side. It's not not competitive. It's not timed. It's not stressed out. Uh, people are generally older, given uh, given the, the the your average VR audience. Um, and it's a very regular game. So people come back every month, which brings me over um, to the fact that this is actually a live service game. So we've been, well, we released uh, the Quest version on the store in um, September 21. And since then we've added over 160, or we published over 160 puzzles. Uh, we have these monthly releases um, of new content um, so that keeps the game fresh. We also released uh, new features over the years. Uh, like, for example, uh, in fall, uh, we released multiplayer. And uh, we hit a new uh, monthly active user record in January 24. So it really is a live service game in the sense that it keeps growing and there's more people playing um, every, like, well, not every month, but uh, every season. 
Um, some other things that might be relevant uh, looking into um, the Apple Vision Pro uh, redesign is we already had some of those features that are relevant there. Not in a way that they could be used on Apple Vision Pro right away, but we had color pass through. So we've been a mixed reality game as it is called on the Quest platform um, since the, the Quest Pro. We had implemented hand tracking um, before as well. So we had at least tried our luck with that. Um, still not super happy with the implementation that we got, but uh, we've, we've at least banged our head against this. And um, we also had or have eye tracking. So for the PSVR 2 and also for the Quest Pro, we did implement a, a version of eye tracking that basically helps you selecting pieces um, with your eyes and so find selecting. And then there's one more thing I think that made a lot of people say like, oh, wow, this game is very, very well suited for the Apple Vision Pro, which is we are a object focused game, not a world focused game. What do I mean by that? It's Puzzling Places is not about being immersed in this like complex world. Like, for example, Asgard's Wrath or something like that, where you really want to be transported somewhere else. But the attention of our players is really on the puzzle itself. So you you work on this you know, object in front of you or on these objects in front of you. And the world around you is basically just a backdrop, which is why it was very easy for us, uh, for example, to to go into mixed reality. Uh, very easy in quotation marks because there's still a lot of uh, art direction challenges around that, but there was no like general breaking the game by not being able to show the world around you. All right, so with this quick introduction of what Puzzling Places is, let's dive into the key design dimensions for the Apple Vision Pro. So what are key design dimensions? Key design dimensions is these are important decisions, important dimensions that you have to make choices on that will you know, lead to you going a certain path in the design space of like how the app that you're building is going to look on the Apple Vision Pro. So the first choice that you have to make, uh, um, Fern already touched upon that, is the tech stack. So you can either go the Swift and Reality Kit route, or you can go with Unity. These are at the moment the only two options. Um, I guess you could also like count in Web uh, WebXR here, and eventually there will be some sort of Unreal support for immersive mode. But at the moment, these are your main main bets here. Then you have to decide what your spatial representation is going to look like. So um, if you've looked into the, the documentation at all, there is uh, 2D windows that can also have like 3D content, but are generally 2D windows. There are volumes and there is what's called immersive mode. Immersive mode can be either like a fully virtual environment or pass through, but it means that the app is all there is. There's not multiple apps like in the windowed and volume modes. And then you have to make a choice about your interactions. Either you can do them indirect, which is, for example, how the system level stuff works. So you look at something, your eyes become the cursor, and then you have a, um, a, a gesture that you can use to interact. You can, like, for example, zoom, tap, select, whatever. Or you can have direct interactions, which is like directly grabbing a object. So you have to move your hand to the object, grab it where it is. Like you don't have this this shortcut of uh, using your eyes as a cursor, or your uh, you know other um, interactions. So across these three design dimensions, what we chose was Unity, because we've never written a single Swift line. Uh, before in our lives, um, coming from a more, actually the Puzzling Places uh, before was uh, created in Unreal. Um, so using a game engine was at least closer to, to where we felt at home and giving the time scope that we had, this seemed like the safer choice for us. For the spatial representation, this might surprise you. We chose actually the volume instead of the immersive mode, which would be the more yeah, the, the thing that is closer to how the game is represented on Quest, where, you know, the game is all there is, is all around you. But we really wanted to go with with this paradigm that Apple introduced of spatial computing that is all about multitasking, having multiple objects or multiple volumes, multiple apps in front of you and, and working with these. Um, so we really wanted to embrace that and, yeah, learn about it and if this would work for puzzling places going forward. And for the interactions, we made a similar decision. Also there you could think um, we would go with the direct interactions. 
um, because that's how how puzzling places works on other platforms. But we again decided to go with kind of what we felt was the was the system default or like the the, the OS default um, of indirect gestures. Just again, um, for the rest of the presentation, I'll be talking about exactly this configuration. So Unity, a volume app in shared space and indirect interactions. Um, a lot of the, the constraints and so on will be specific to that. Um, if you go other routes, you might have other options. I just wanted to stick with one and really go into that. All right, so then let's dive into designing puzzling places for the Apple Vision Pro. So for the tech stack, um, puzzling places, as I said, was made in Unreal 4. It, at the time we were developing it, like the, the SDKs and integrations were mature and proven and out for a while. So um, they were basically feature complete. Um, and we had about two years dev time. We had a very early version on SideQuest, like a prototype, but then basically took about one and a half to two years to, to develop the full version that then launched on the Quest Store. This looks, uh, uh, yeah, so it's a mature live service game with like a fully developed code base that was, you know, developed over a long period of time. Um, for the Apple Vision Pro app, the volume app, um, it, this is a bit different because we made it from scratch in Unity. Unreal is not supported yet, especially not if you want to use windowed mode. Um, and uh, we had to work with a lot of work in progress, SDK um, and compatibility. So Unity, especially in these early days um, before the actual launch was uh, yeah, a bit complicated to work with here and there because just some things didn't work. So it's kind of like a subset of Unity that you had to work with. And we did the whole thing, as I said, in about two and a half months dev time. So we really decided to like make this a, a minimal viable product, focusing on the core gameplay, trying to really take the core gameplay of what makes Puzzling Places Puzzling Places and reimagine that um, for the Apple Vision Pro. Um, this is important because like, uh, I, I think actually working in Unity was, was in, in hindsight, a, a more of a blessing than a curse because it really gave us this freedom to, to start from scratch and, and work with like this much more lightweight code base, um, making, making, yeah, bigger design, uh, choices or like, um, going different paths there. Um, because I know that this is a bit of a more technical audience. I want to dive a bit deeper into some of the uh, questions around the tech stack. So some of the tech challenges for bounded volume uh, Unity apps um, is you have very limited information on inputs and tracking data. So if you come from, from Quest or like any other VR headset, this will feel very weird in the beginning. You will only have the interaction world position, the, the, the world position delta pinch rotation of, of a interaction when a user taps. You don't know where the hands are. You don't know where people are looking. You don't have a head position. Only in the moment someone looks at a collider and taps, you have during the tap, that's that's when you get the data. And then when they release, it's gone again. So you don't know. Um, this takes some getting used to. Uh, there's there's some weird things uh, or like, I mean, just some unexpected things. We, for example, uh, noticed at some point that, uh, that the volumes were spawning, like the volume was spawning fairly far away which would lead to like a not ideal player um, experience. So in a VR app, you would usually just, uh, you know, get the head position, ask it like, hey, how far away is it? Uh, and then, you know, show a little little warning thing um, about like that. Um, so you see down here, there's this for best player experience, move it closer. Um, in Vision Pro or like for Vision Pro, that was not possible because we didn't have the head position. So uh, Sha actually had to hack together a, a shader uh, that uh, kind of deduces this information and then uh, fades the whole thing uh, in and out based on that. Uh, so weird workarounds that you would not expect uh, when you come from Quest development. There is no spatial audio support at the moment in Unity. So you only have one stereo emitter at the center of the volume. And uh, there is some spatialization happening, but it's on system level and you have basically no yeah, control over it. For a very audio heavy game like us, that was of course like not great news. In the end, it didn't end up being so bad because um, the way, because you have this volume in front of you. So it makes sense that it uh, audio comes from there. We don't do this level of specialization that we did on the immersive app. Uh, there's shader limitations. So URP is recommended. Standard shaders are wrapped for Material X. So what, what Unity basically does if you make a volume app is it, it takes 
the volume app, it uh, takes your, your game logic, compiles it in, in C++ libraries, and then wraps a lot of the other stuff into a format that, that Apple can work with. So um, the standard shaders are, are turned into material X shaders, which often are expensive, more expensive than you'd expect sometimes. And sometimes they don't translate one-to-one. -one. And if you use shader graph stuff, uh, that's compiled to metal, which again is not always one-to-one. -one. Some nodes are just not available. Some functionality is not available. Um, there is a bunch of, of documentation that you can look into on, on Unity's website, which is great. So you can at least get a feeling for like what is what is supported, what's not. There's no partial support for many rendering, particle, and UI features. Again, like you can check out what is supported and what's not. And even weird things like you can use not concave, you, you can't use concave colliders. You don't have a splash screen. Like this stuff is all in progress. So I hope it's going to get better, but just be aware that you might have to uh, work around some stuff. All right, so let's change gears. Uh, let's look into spatial representation, the second um, design dimension. So in VR, you have this infinite canvas of a simulated world uh, that you can work with. And uh, the app is all there is. So if a player like opens up a VR app, that's all there is. That's the entire world that they have. Um, they can use it as they please, but you also have their full attention, which is really cool and a rare thing these days uh, in the age of second screens. Uh, and locomotion is possible. It's a highly debated thing, and it's hard to do good, but like it's possible. It like feels conceptually right to move through a world in which you're in. And um, so the the puzzling places uh, design that we ended up with here uh, on Quest or in VR is is like you have this very tranquil environment. It is not distracting you, but it grounds you. It gives you a feeling of space, and you feel like cozy there and you have um, all the pieces laid out in front of you on this world you can pull them to to you and you can puzzle um, in peace uh, but you can also use really your world to organize your pieces to organize the stuff around you um, and to to uh, yeah basically have your you know the the roof pieces here the the forest pieces here so you can really work with that as you please um if you do a volume app on Apple Vision Pro, you suddenly are restricted to a very limited floating space in front of you. And you might only be one volume among many. Um, so this needs much more focus. And also, if you are working within that volume, it's conceptually weird to think about like how can you actually lock your locomote there. So you have to come up with very different concepts. Um, so it's something that we just completely discarded for, that, for now. So what we came up with as a design was much more focused, much more constrained in a way. Um, we have this central piece that you put puzzle pieces to, and you can only add pieces to that. You can't like work on multiple regions in the, at the same time as you can in the VR version. Uh, and you only have these four pieces on the side in your shelf, and they will always fit. So we basically skipped this whole part of sorting. You don't have to go through the sorting motions. You don't have to, you know, group all the, the forest pieces, all the all the roof pieces, so on. You will automatically only get pieces that fit. Um, this way, we, we we use the available vol volume much more efficiently. Um, we reduce clutter and we increase readability. And it just becomes much more focused uh, and flowy. So VR is basically a world filled with interactable objects versus the volume app is a interactable object in the user's world. So the design approaches here are very different. You don't have to fill up a world um, on, on the Vision Pro. You can really focus on making this interactable object. So spatial representation also means if you are in this shared environment and people are multitasking, doing many things, uh, shared sp space means shared attention. So you also have to redesign your game in terms of like your you know cognitive resources and uh, cognitive load, and this means simplifying the core game loop. In our case, like as I said, we we don't do any sorting. We skip that step. Uh, skip that step. It, we have to make it much more easy to jump in and out. Um, so you can just like always pick this first piece from the shelf, and you can fit it somewhere. You don't have to, you know, get back into the space and be like, oh, where did I put these pieces and get reoriented. So it's very easy to jump in and out because people might just be doing that uh, at a much higher frequency. And um, you can also, or like we also adjusted the content intensities. For example, the the audio effects and so on, we had to tune down, and people are actually already asking for like a way to mute that, so they have the the app open and don't have the audio running all the time versus. If you are in VR and this is all there is, of course, it makes makes much, much more sense to have this level of, of audio. 
All right, then uh, let's check the time. Yeah, we're good. So let's dive into interactions. So interactions in VR uh, are much more embodied. They're these direct interactions. Like these were the games that were very successful that have like this full tangible control. They give you all degrees of freedom uh, and, and you really feel like you're there and you have a body. So for puzzling places, again, you know, if you want to place a piece, you have to pick it up, pull it towards you, and then you have to really move your head around, uh, hand around and like, find like, oh, where does it go? You have to rotate it. You have to do all that with your direct input, direct hand. Um, but it's also no problem because you have this like fine grained control because you have the controllers. You can do all these rotations, translations, all that stuff. With indirect interactions, you have to build much more magical interfaces. So it's all about reading, almost mind reading the intent of the user and then acting it through assistive controls. So that might sound a bit abstract, but let me show you an example. So here, if you look at one of the pieces, you can tap and then you start moving it. Uh, you don't have to actually grab the piece, but you can just tap and move it. And while you move it around, the interface will read your intent of like, where could you want to place it right now? Where are you trying to place this piece? Uh, and then it will just like try to automatically rotate the piece because we don't have this information. When we're actually building the app, we didn't even have pinch rotation information that is available now, but like back then it wasn't. So we were really like, okay, how can we actually do rotation? And in the end we decided to like not do rotation and just let the interface do it um, for you. This is really great when it works and really frustrating when it doesn't. So uh, that's the big caveat here. Um, be really mindful of that because uh, it feels magical if the interface does what you want to and just like reads your mind, but it feels really frustrating if your mind was somewhere very different um, and you wanted to do something else. Um, again, uh, I think we get like for puzzling places, I think it is a good fit because the game is fairly simple in that sense. But if you do much more complex interactions, this might get much more uh, complicated because you, yeah. You might have many failure cases or edge cases that you don't even think about when developing. Um, I want to share with you a way of thinking about this that might be a little bit different, but I found very helpful. So I call it the octopus paradigm because um, the way how a octopus uh, nervous system is organized, it is very decentralized. So an octopus has a brain, but it also has ganglia kind of like small brains in every tentacle. And um, I mean, no one knows it, but uh, this is how, how the scientists imagine a octopus does things is the crown, its brain formulates a general intent of like, hey, give me that food over there. And then the reach, the tentacles deal with the exact execution. So they will like try to like find out like how to actually position the tentacle and to get get to the food and grab it and move it over. So this is very similar in how we designed our interface for puzzling places. Like you, as a user, you formulate a general intent of like, hey, I think this piece here goes over there to that spot. And then we will move it, we will adjust the depth, uh, we will like rotate it. Uh, and so you can really focus on like where you think the thing is going and we do, we take care of all the details. So redesign takeaways, let's do this quickly. We started to think about the Apple Vision Pro volume apps um, in the context of puzzling places as a spatial 3D screen with indirect two and a half D input. So this is again, very different from like this embodiment maximalism of, of, of VR where you are a person in a world. Here is, there is like a screen over there. It is 3D suddenly it has depth and it's beautiful and it looks great and you can position it where you want it uh, and you have a more advanced input method than just like using a mouse or like a, a controller or something by using your hands. But it is still very much the separation of like a screen and you outside of this world. Um, let's do a quick recap here of all the uh, points that we went over. So the tech in VR, you have full features, you have full tracking access, you have all the things, you can go crazy. Um, versus uh, for a volume app, you have this feature subset at the moment that might get better. And it's also different if you go different tech rounds. Um, but what stays similar, unless you go fully immersive, is that you have this access to very limited tracking data and just 
reflecting a difference in, in the paradigm of spatial computing versus VR. The space is for VR a world full uh, uh, full of objects, full of interactable objects uh, versus for the volume app, it's this interactable object in the user's world. Interactions, you have this embodiment maximalism in VR with full direct control of everything, all the degrees of freedom versus this indirect more assistive interface should you opt for it um, following this octopus paradigm. And the game design also is this full focus, you need to really fill up the world, you make it challenging, make it complex, make it interesting versus in a Apple Vision Pro volume app, you have shared focus. So you have to be a bit more gentle with the users, a bit more guided, easy to pick up uh, and maybe accept the fact that you will not be the only uh, focus of attention there. In general, like, especially in hindsight, it feels like it was not so much a port, but really a redesign and a rewrite, which I said earlier also, maybe it was good that we that we did it in Unity so we didn't have to deal so much with the um, with the code base that, that was already there, but we really could go fresh at it. And the overall direction is really, it's it's a simpler, more focused game. Um, if, you, if you look at it on a scale from mobile game to VR game, I almost feel it's somewhere in the middle. So a lot of the, a lot of the design choices um, that we made and a lot of the, the solutions that we came up with felt much more like in between these two paradigms than like, almost beyond VR or something as like some people think about the, the Vision Pro is like this was like the next thing after VR. But design wise is um, it feels like almost in between mobile VR and uh, mobile and VR, which also makes sense if you keep in mind that Apple really designs the, uh, the Apple Vision Pro also so you can use a lot of its 2D apps on it. So they made a lot of this uh, design choices and, and interaction choices that, you know, enable you to do that. So Initial feedback, what did people think of the game? So let's start with reviews. So generally uh, reviews were great. Um, people really liked it. You always have, you know, people using reviews for feature requests, like muting the sound, I already mentioned that. That's definitely something that we learned. And of course you have people complaining because uh, shortly after release, we also added a uh, pack. So the game itself is free, comes with free puzzles. We also added a pack with another free puzzles for $6 um, to actually, you know, make some money because uh, we have to pay bills and want to eat. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, some people, it's uh, always too much. So ratings were great. We are rated at a 4.9 out of five uh, with 93 reviews so far. Uh, which puts us as a pretty good, nice uh, upper spot here in the rating distribution. But more on that later. Press was, for our taste, a bit disappointing. So we sent out our press release and we were covered by, you know, the usual VR press. We made it into some some uh, lists uh, of like VR press and also some like more general um, publications like the information. But overall, it felt pretty silent. We expected a bit more there. Um, we were not part of the official Apple communication. I think that would have helped. But even even there, uh, it felt uh, a lot of the reviewers came out fairly late. A lot of the YouTubers came out fairly late with, with their stuff. And they focused on like general compute or like on Apple Arcade games. And and very few actually do, uh, like did dive into the, the games that were out there um, beyond Apple Arcade. One of the most interesting things that came up is the Nerf game discussion. So we had a bunch of people, especially people that never played the game, um, but saw the trailers or like the online communication, were like, wow, this game is incredibly nerfed. Uh, like it's, you know, like a downgrade from the original ones, uh, much, much less compelling on the Apple Vision Pro, uh, limited controls and um, all these kind of things which was super interesting to us um, because, I mean, it kind of makes sense if 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 you bought into VR and the promise of VR, it kind of makes sense to me that, that this feels like limited. But then again, also, I think this is not the audience that the Vision Pro is designed for. Um, on the other hand, we also had people that were like, oh, wow, um, this is much more fun than on Quest 3. Um, people that asked like, hey, can we, port this more casual game mode over to Quest uh, for, for them to play. And um, yeah, it's just like simplified UI looks great uh, and so on. So it's it's a bit of a of a um, 
balance there, but it's uh, I found this is like one of the most interesting things that happened after release uh, to follow this uh, this this debate, and it it partially got quite quite heated, quite emotional, um, which I think we see we see like this this uh, rift between people that have been in VR a long time, like they they feel a bit alienated from from how the uh, Vision Pro is designed. All right, um, as we're coming. Towards the end, let's uh, jump into the last part, which is the App Store landscape. Um, so here, I um, yeah wanted to go over some data, but first a few words about publishing because uh, this came up quite a lot, and um, also Fern asked me to, to at least touch upon it. So in general, like publishing, the publishing workflows for uh, Vision Pro are very well documented. Uh, you can also check all the iOS tutorials; they largely apply. It's largely the same. Um, you got great tooling with Xcode and all that stuff. Uh, you just have to be on Mac. Uh, then, then you have great tooling. If you're not on Mac, then you don't have tooling. Um, there's a quick app approval um, turnaround. So that is also fairly painless. They've done a really great job. And there is QA, but no hard store curation like you would know it from um, Quest. And I think a lot of people are like, what? Uh, no hard store curation? This sounds great. It does, but like it comes with a little bit of a caveat and um, we'll talk about that at the very end, why it might not be no curation as you imagine it. So how crowded is Vision OS? There's around, like that's the rumor that goes around, about 200,000 devices uh, that have been sold. I'm not sure if every if all of them have, have been shipped. And like the other day, like we heard something about like a thousand apps on there already. Um, so I'm making this very like back in the envelope uh, weird calculation, but um, I'm just taking basically um, the number of active devices or customers um, divided by apps. So there's about like 200 customers per app. Okay, how does that compare? On Quest, you have about 25 million devices out there. These were the latest numbers I found, and you have 650 apps on the store. So that Quest store is very heavily curated. They don't let so many apps on the store. But the nice thing is you have 38,000 customers per app. So you have a very big audience for very few apps, which is what they're trying to do with their curation so that developers actually can make a living. And then if you compare that to Steam or iOS, um, so Steam has 4,700 customers per app uh, and iOS 400. So you can see like if if, if numbers go to uh, like 400, 200, like it's it's a very crowded store already. And this is, this is a very crowded store. So uh, there's a lot of apps given the install base that we have. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're doing things for it. There's a lot of people, I think, that are trying their luck throwing something out there onto the platform. So what are the main, uh, yeah, what's the main main thing that's on the store? So uh, Ken Bai tweeted it the other day. So I picked that up because it fit well into the presentation. So on Quest, you have pretty much 68, 69% games uh, and a few apps and a bit of entertainment on Apple Vision Pro that looks very different. You have mainly apps, uh, 68%, and only 12% games, 12.5% games, which shows you something about like also how developers perceive the the placement and positioning of the device. So it's I think that the thing that captures it best is is Quest is a kind of a game game console, and the Vision Pro tries to be a general purpose computing device. Um, like, you know, a computer or a iPad or whatever. So you will have much more apps and less games. So how are the top apps doing, actually? Um, I went around and compiled a list of about 50 apps that were all reachable by clicking on different buttons on the um, on the store page so that, that you actually see in the device. Because if you go to the web view, you don't see the number of ratings um, at all at this point. So you can't crawl it really at this point. Uh, so I sat down and basically wrote it down for 50 apps and um, compiled a bit of data for us to have a look at together. These are the top 15 apps according to the number of reviews. So Juno is basically a YouTube app because YouTube didn't do their own app. Um, there is a game called Akuzi Luona. Luona. I, we haven't still figured out how to pronounce it, but um, it's actually very similar to uh, Puzzling Places, a little less challenging um, and using uh, CG models. 
Jigspace is basically a 3D presentation device and Crunchyroll, uh, you might know as an anime streaming service. TikTok, you all know. Cellwalk is a educational app. Encounter Dinosaurs is a demo app from, from uh, Apple itself and so on. But you can see there's 3,000 reviews. There's about 1,200 reviews. And then it like goes down very, very quickly already. So like a lot of these apps... Um, have like a hundred reviews or uh, fifty reviews. You see plenty of stuff. Uh, actually, um, here's here's more. If you take away the top three here, uh, you see this. There's a lot of things that are you know even under 10, 12 reviews. And that is that is apps like Excel or Zoom or these kind of things, um, which tells you again like the 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 number of of, of devices out there is not that high yet. And um, I'm actually surprised like and I'm, I'm i'm wondering what are people doing with with their with their devices um because so few apps have reviews i mean again reviews are kind of a proxy for installs so on steam for example you can say uh take the number of reviews times 60 this will probably not hold here you will have to use a different factor but still it is kind of a proxy um where you can get a feeling for like how many installs a app has so what's the pricing looking like uh, 76% of apps on the App Store currently are free, 10% are paid, and 14% are arcade titles. So, um, yeah, I think what we're seeing here is that that the, the monetization model that is shaping up to be the default on Vision OS is following very closely to mobile. Like we noticed from like iOS and, and um, Apple Play stores that a lot of apps are free and then you actually monetize through in-app purchases which is actually also what we did for public places um in this graph here i plotted the the price against the number of reviews uh the negative price here is arcade titles in case you wonder and there was only one app here that had over 50 reviews that was actually paid which is black box a, a another puzzle game um which you know tells me okay like if they have over 60 reviews they have at least a significant number of downloads and people who paid for the app um like everybody else who had prices didn't do so well all right and then last one how does app discovery work this is uh data from a um app that i have access to this data to so you can have a guess which one that is um, it's about 85% of the of the clicks on this page come from the App Store browsing. And um, the App Store browsing right now is is very much dependent on collections and categories and so on. So you really, you know, have to have a good placement. Only 14% come from search and then a uh, half a percent from the web referrer and then I got another half percent from the app referrer. Um, so here's where, you know, the curation kicks in again. If you don't get like a good placement among these 1000 apps that are already out there in the app store, it will be very hard for people to find you. So you can actually think of the app store at the moment as a combination of the, if you want to compare it to Meta and Quest, it's a combination of App Lab and, um, and the official store in terms of curation. There's just like not, not a hard line in there. All right, then App Store takeaways. So it's easy to get in new creation, but limited install base. There might not be, or there are not that many customers per app. And there's a bias towards apps over games. Mobile style freemium monetization seems to become the default. Discovery is heavily reliant on Apple Store placement, but to give the thing a positive spin at the end, I think there is a lot of room for good content still. So a lot of the apps that are out there are very like simple basic games or like uh, apps that were designed in the simulator. So I think there is really still like a lot of, you know, room for building cool stuff, good stuff, uh, and that can still surface. Uh, just keep in mind that there is a hard ceiling um, with this limited install base at this point, but you can also use this time to create a good foundation for the millions and millions of headsets that are to come. Maybe, we don't know, um, but of course we all hope. And with that, I would like to close it. Um, my name is Daniel Sproul. I'm from Realities.io and we make puzzling places. Try it on all the devices that you have access to and enjoy it there. And uh, now I'm ready for questions. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel, for this uh, 
very brief but very uh, fulfilling, I would say, presentation, both from development perspective, design perspective, and also even the App Store analytics, which we haven't seen even from the business analysts, right? So since you are part of it, you also even analyzed. So everyone is also uh, uh, appreciating uh, what you have uh, shared with us. Uh, and also, Shah, thanks for answering almost uh, all the questions. So uh, we have a couple of questions. We have still room for a couple of questions. Anything maybe, Shah, would you like to uh, highlight uh, from the questions that you would prefer to yeah. answer verbally? Uh, one maybe question from uh, my side. Uh, maybe we can also revisit the um, the poll in the meantime. Um, what is your uh, what is your like uh, current uh, direction? Like we have also asked like uh, what is the um, circumstances of like to create? Uh, what does it cost to create an app? Right. Of course, your own time. But in addition, that you have to buy Vision Pro, uh, Unity Pro. So, uh, do you have any opinion? Any of you maybe can speak on itself because we have to also understand and guide to people who may really want to start building yeah maybe i can uh, i can uh, answer that because i'm the one with the with the credit card usually uh <laughs> okay. so yeah we had to we had to buy max uh, we didn't have any um we had to buy uh the the, the developer uh program thing which is another 100 bucks so like i don't know like three you know like 3k for for a macbook three and a half k for a vision pro uh, uh, like, like you know, the the pro license for a year or two, um, which is another you know one two k, and um, yeah, I mean it 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 there there is some starting cost if if you're a business it's it's definitely doable if you're like a lone developer it's it's it is significant, and yeah, just keep in mind like you have to make that money back and at the moment it's it's just hard. Like you will like this is a long term investment. We see this as a very long term investment. Um, for us, it was important to learn, to learn this new paradigm, to learn about this new platform, um, and and you know we can we can do that uh, to to invest early and and have that. But like I don't expect us to break even this year um, uh, on on the the yeah money that it cost us to to make the app. And we we kind of already had a a app. We ha had content for it and so on. So. Uh, did 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 you meet the break even of your hardware and software cost, no. or even that one? Okay, okay, okay. It gives a quite a bit of idea. But um, I mean, you know, it's early. Like it, this yeah. is this is, uh, yeah. I would not have I mean, expected it. So yeah, I mean, this is first one of the becoming first one of the first apps, and how Apple is uh, promoting spotlighting you. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming up. Maybe uh, let's take over quickly, Sha, before we move yeah. to the roundtable session. I tried to answer as many as I could. 28 are already answered because we don't have much time. Um, so one of the things that a couple of people asked, and it was already addressed in Daniel's presentation, but maybe I can go over it again, is the idea of why did we decide not to do fully immersive? Why did we redesign puzzle in places at all? Um, as Daniel already said, Basically, this is not the type of investment where we thought we were going to make a lot of money. And uh, we had the option of remaking the game we already knew works, basically the way it is as a pass-through, quest-free, hand-tracking. Um, but based on the data that we have already uh, from Quest, hand-tracking is not a very popular, popular feature, uh, mostly because, well, the, the data is a lot noisier than you would want it to be. And... Quest, uh, compared to Quest, the hand tracking from Apple is better because they have more processing power and the cameras are better and all that. But it is a lot better when it works together with eye tracking. So there's this thing of, do you want to remake a VR game on Apple Vision Pro? You can do that. And a bunch of people asked if a fully immersive is the same as a Quest. Yes and no, kind of, because the way Apple segments the apps is very different. So you can have a fully immersive environment that is just for you. And then you can still have several different representational windows inside. You can have a bunch of 2D windows and a bunch of 3D volumes and all that. So it's not one-to-one -one exactly the same, but you could basically remake Quest games in a non-shared space and um, you can have it fully immersive. So the reason why we decided not to go that way because we wanted to learn something new about our own game and also because we decided to put our chips on where Apple thinks this is special. Uh, if you go down the path of fully immersive, 
and a space just for yourself. So not a shared space, but just a full space. The user won't be able to watch YouTube as you're, they're playing your game. They wouldn't be able to, you know, go over on their Twitter. They can't work at the same time. And what we wanted to try was, can we make a toy that's like a, uh, like, like a, like a toy you have on your table, you know, like a fidget toy or whatever that you play with. That was one of the things that we talked about a lot based on puzzling places so that people can do other things like listening to audiobooks and YouTube and all those things and open Excel or whatever. Um, so yeah, that was basically answering three questions already. One of them was, why did we redesign? The other one was, if uh, fully immersive is the same as basically having a quest free app, yes and no. Um, and yeah, I forgot the, the, the last yeah, one. And I mean, there's also like nothing, nothing stop well, at the moment there's technical reasons stopping us but like down the road i imagine um if 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 this app becomes very successful we might even like build in a, mo uh, a thing where you can go from from like the the, the volume app it, into this immersive space and then suddenly you have the full shelf again you can play like you do on the quest like the, 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 this is what i really like about the, the the vision pro also and it's 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 approach is like it is much more fluent in that uh like it's not this this uh uh, like the quests, like you can have one app at a time and you can maybe switch between them, but like you can have, you can transition, you can like treat this virtual space much more fluently and in much more interesting ways. So that's just like something where the SDKs have to have to catch up. And then of course, also it has to be economically viable to, to put the effort in to do this. Mm -hmm. Another question that popped up quite a lot is the whole Unreal and Unity question um, of one question was, would we have stayed in Unreal if there was support for it? Absolutely, because we have all the ecosystem and tooling and everything else built. We have a live service game, so we have a lot of pipeline tools that we have built over the years, and having access to that would be amazing. Um, but at the same time, some questions regarding visual quality. The thing to keep in mind is that, as Daniel said, basically Apple converts uh, whatever Unity scene you have, it converts to some sort of meta information, which is red by Apple in its own render pipeline. So the rendering is done from Apple's side. So it doesn't really matter if you're making your game in Unity or Unreal. At the end of the day, Apple is taking care of rendering. Um, so yeah, there wouldn't be that much of a difference there. Um, that's not something you need to worry about. And as far as porting is concerned, we did have some problems because one of the things that if you have developed for both engines, Unreal Engine is absolutely insanely large and for everything that you can imagine there is a function library there that you can just use and porting our code back to unity we had to write a lot of those things in order to be able to have the same game loop uh, but nothing so drastic that we couldn't do in half a day and the biggest one is probably audio engine um, unity famously doesn't have a really good audio engine integration uh, you can use wise which for a project of this size would be too much overhead so you do what you usually do, which is you just rewrite an audio engine for the 50th time uh, when you open a new um, Unity project. So Yeah, there, there's like the, the, the usual questions around like Unreal versus Unity. So no, for, for a game like Passing Places, like visual fidelity is, is not an issue. We, we're, we're basically having unlit uh, meshes with like minimal effects and all that stuff. So for both Unity and Unreal, we, we're using like a fraction of, of all the magic that is in there. Uh, for us, it really it doesn't matter. We could, we could probably do this in, in like uh, WebXR and it would look the same. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is regarding porting custom shaders. Uh, then you touched on that too. Some shaders are basically you take a URP shader and they convert to a Material X shader that is just written by Apple. Those are actually quite expensive because it doesn't seem like Apple branches out and compiles out things you don't need for the features you don't need. It seems to be calculating everything that a standard PBR shader has at all time. Um, but you can also use shader graph and that would compile to metal. Um, so how difficult is that? That is extremely difficult. <laughs> Not because of the reasons you might expect. It's actually quite, uh, you need to take care of a lot of things, but you need to keep in mind that uh, this is then compiled on a different platform. So what works in simulator is different to how it looks in unity and it is different to how it used like apple vision pro because when it gets compiled it uses different information and potentially different driver functions um so that's also not a very straightforward thing you need to leave some time uh, in for in order to fine tune some of the shader looks yeah one one maybe last uh, question to to quickly answer on like do you think uh, uh, apple vision pro being so expensive people will pay more for the same apps no, 
<laughs> that's the that's the mean thing for a developer. <clears throat> uh i think for on the quest people are used to pay for games and like for games you you pay 10 20 you know maybe up to 60 bucks uh because that's 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 what you use for for games and it's like a one time purchase and then there's dlcs and all that the apple vision pro seems to be much closer in in people's perception also because there is this link to the ios store to to work like a mobile store where you don't pay anything for a for an app upfront uh, uh, and then you you kind of like have this in-app monetization or so on so uh, um, i mean yeah we, we we feel and i think that's also what i saw from the data people are price sensitive and people who are like gaps that are trying to to demonetize on the high end are not doing that great uh so it's it's a bit ironic you would think that someone who shells out three and a half k for a headset would would not be so squeamish but um that's uh that's what we're seeing I mean, if you remember the DK two times, uh, there's a thin line between becoming an early adopter and developer, right? I think it's the same thing with AVP right now. Uh, I think uh, in the future, we will have maybe more uh, accessible options as a developer or studio. Uh, 